All right, let's go ahead and begin. Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Emily Kloss, and I work in communications at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and also support the Global Power System Transformation Consortium, also known as GPST. Today's webinar is presented by GPST and in partnership with Imperial College London and is titled Illustration of GPST Teaching Material through the VSC HVDC Example. <clears throat> now, before we get started today, I did want to go over a few housekeeping items with everyone to make sure that we all have a smooth experience on Zoom today. The first is that this webinar is being recorded and it will be shared with attendees following the event. Um, as an attendee, you can expect to receive an email within the next week or so with a link to the recording and also a link to all of the resources shared during the session. You will be automatically muted upon joining and throughout the webinar. Um, if you would like to add comments, share input or share introductions, we encourage you to please use the chat feature. However, if you would like to ask questions at any point during the session, we encourage you to please use the Q&A function, which can be found on your toolbar and is distinct from the chat feature. Uh, we do have time carved out at the end of the session for questions and answers. So you can ask your question at any point and we will be sure to answer it at the end of the session. Um, if you're having technical issues, please use the chat feature to message me, Emily Kloss, and I will be happy to help you. And lastly, you can adjust your audio through the audio settings. Um, if you're having issues, you can dial in and listen by phone and all of the dial in information can be found in your registration confirmation email. All right, and with that, I will hand it over to Balarco to share introductions and introduce the session. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Emily. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Balako Chaudhary. Uh, my colleague, uh, Tim Green, and I look after the workforce development piece of GPST. Uh, with a lot of support, I must say, from colleagues at the National Renewable Energy Labs in the US. So I would start with a very quick overview of where we stand in the workforce development pillar uh, to set the scene for this webinar and uh, Tim would coordinate the question and answer session at the end. But today's show will be run mainly by my colleagues, uh, Adria Junian Ferry and Joan Mark Rodriguez, who have recently developed the course material on voltage source converter-based high voltage DC transmission. And I'm sure they're quite keen to showcase it today. Uh, Adria is a senior lecturer uh, and Joan Mark is a postdoctoral researcher at Imperial College and their expertise is in uh, power electronics and control with application to both uh, transmission and distribution. Can we go to the next slide, Emily, please? I think most of you here are familiar with uh, GPST, uh, Global Power System Transformation Consortium. And as the name suggests, it's a worldwide initiative driven by the system operators to try and catalyze a rapid and widespread transition to a zero carbon electricity grid. Uh, the activities of GPST are centered around these five pillars uh, that you see on the slide. And the focus of today's webinar is uh, pillar three, which uh, is about workforce development. It aims to facilitate the development of a diverse and inclusive workforce that has the right kind of know-how and skills to enable power system transformation at a global scale. A major part of this pillar activity is around um, developing the course material for a number of what we call forward-looking topics. Um, although the knowledge of these topics are deemed essential for power system transformation, uh, many of these topics aren't generally covered at adequate depth in university curriculum and even in training programs within the industry. So the aim here is to bridge this gap uh, by making the course material freely available for use by the universities, system operators, and other stakeholders wherever they have gaps. Um, as some of you might uh, recall, around this time last year, uh, GPST published a teaching agenda 
which identified about 90 or forward looking topics under nine broad subject areas that you see on the right. And recently, a group of leading system operators with a high fraction of variable renewables or inverter based resources in their system have prioritized these topics based on the challenges they face and the and the skill gaps they see in their workforce. Uh, now, the course material for each of these topics is meant to have four to five hours of video lecture with slides uh, supported by exercises and assessments uh, using open source tools uh, wherever possible. And you will see an example of that today. Overall, it's a fairly big task to work up the course material for all these topics. And we would really need experts around the globe to contribute to make this happen. Uh, so far, we have just made a start with uh, only five out of 90 odd topics. And thanks to generous support from the uh, US Agency of International Development coming through National Renewable Energy Labs and also support from Imperial College that has allowed us to uh, develop this material. Uh, today's webinar would showcase the course material on voltage source converter based HVDC. And this is meant to be an exemplar of what GPST aims to produce for other topics in, in due course. So there are four more topics that are being worked up at the moment by leading women experts. And this is part of our attempt to promote uh, gender di diversity in workforce development. I won't go into the details of those, but uh, what we will do after the webinar is we will circulate a short description of all five topics, uh, including uh, content summary, learning outcomes, prerequisites, uh, and so on. And we are very keen to uh, A, have your comments and suggestions on this, and B, uh, work with you um, in due course to road test some of these course material uh, before sort of uh, putting it out in public domain. So if you are interested in taking part in any of this, please do get in touch. So without further ado, I would hand over to uh, Adria and Joan Ma to give you a taster of the course material on uh, voltage system water based HVDC. Uh, with that, I'll hand over to Adria. Thank you very much, Balarco, for the introduction. Hello, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to be here with you today to tell you a bit more about the course we've prepared on VSC HVDC transmission. And my aim is to give you an overview of how we uh, design this course and tell you our vision for the modules uh, or for the courses with uh, Pillar 3 of GPST. Um, next slide, please. So to put things in context for the VSC HBC module, we asked uh, Ben Marshall, the technical manager of the National HBC Center in Scotland to tell us a bit about um, what the center does and what is the importance of VSC HBC. So you'll see a short video now. Um, I have a couple more videos in this presentation to show you as well a preview of um, how the lecture material will look like or the exercises and the solutions for those exercises will look like. So um, Emily, if you want to play the video. We cannot hear it. Thank you. Thank you both Balaka and Tim for introducing me to uh, this session. Um, I'm Ben Marshall, I'm the technical manager here at the National HVDC Centre. So welcome to this verbal PST session on uh, HVDC converters. Um, so who, who am I and why am I here? Well, uh, I'm the uh, technology manager at the centre, which uh, is a uh, sheet transmission owned and operated centre on behalf of all of the transmission owners and system operators across GB. Uh, we manage the de-risking of uh, the uh, introduction of converters, large-scale HVDC and other uh, into the GB system. And we, we do that by providing a host and simulation environment, focusing on a range of EMT studies, both in real time and uh, also uh, offline in the earlier stages. Um, the importance of MFC technology has only grown over the last 20 years and set a growth of fervor. Uh, MNC technology is uniquely flexible in that utilizing LGBT uh, 
valve operation, it can flexibly switch uh, against a, a wide array of situations and uh, has the layering of its control structure, which allows it to modulate very efficiently and quickly against the NC system. Why is this very important? Well, MMC uh, technology uh, as a subset of VSC multi-source converter technology is the critical uh, technology enabling large-scale offshore HVDC uh, implementation. There's a number of projects already, both in Europe and China, with more coming in, in the US, uh, which are deploying HVDC as the principal means of transmission between the offshore environment and the onshore system. Within GB, we're expecting to see our offshore quotients grow uh, from around 10 gigawatts today to over 40 gigawatts by 2030 and over 80 gigawatts by 2050. We need to understand what these converters can do to contribute to the robustness of the grid and to provide security with increasing to offshore uh, disconnected AC islands, which have no inherent inertia uh, or, or indeed uh, stiff voltage sources of their own. Um, so how do we how, how do we do that here? A technology enabling large scale offshore HVDC offshore uh, implementation. There's a number of projects already, both in Europe and China, with more coming in, in the US, uh, which are deploying HVDC as the principal means of transmission between the offshore environment and the onshore system. Within GB, we're expected to see our offshore quotients grow uh, from around 10 gigawatts today to over 40 gigawatts by 2030 and over 80 gigawatts by 2050. We need to understand what these converters can do to contribute to the robustness of the grid and to provide security with increasing to offshore uh, disconnected AC islands, which have no inherent inertia uh, or, or indeed uh, stiff voltage sources of their own. Um, so how do we how, how do we do that here at the centre? Well, we, we bring together uh, network models, and obviously the detailed models of converters, or indeed the hardware controls of those converters. Um, it's really essential as we go forward that we have that influx of skilled people who are able to conduct increasingly more simulations in the electromagnetic transmit domain, understanding what these control systems see, but equally are able to construct and stru uh, study the structure of those controls to understand what they do, why they do it where the sensitivities and trade-offs in that behaviour are. So I commend you uh, to the Global Power System Transformation Program here, which is looking to enrich your understanding of uh, MMC HVDC control, but hopefully will inspire you to be some of the simulation and indeed other engineers, civil engineers, plant engineers of the future supporting HVDC. As increasingly it takes the prominent role in delivering our net zero connections and networks of the future. Thank you. Thank you. Next slide. Okay, so um, for those who are unfamiliar with the technology, um, this is, these are a couple of pictures from Siemens showing uh, how the trend, uh, converter stations that we, you would find in uh, each end of an HVDC transmission line with VSC technology would look like. So um, this technology um, is based on a type of power electronic converter, which is called the modular multi-level converter. And it's a specific type of voltage source converter, which is a big family of converters that includes both the small inverters that you would use in uh, PV systems, and the uh, uh, wind turbine generators and up to the scale of, of HVDC. Now, um, it's a bit hard to understand what's going on when you see these pictures. So next slide, I have um, uh, like a simplified diagram of uh, the converter circuit, just to introduce some of the terminology that I'm going to be mentioning um, at some point during the presentation. So if you can move to the next slide, Okay, so um, this is how the circuit of, of an MMC looks like. So it's a, it's a three-phase AC-DC converter. DC AC converter is bidirectional in power. It has full control of the active and reactive power. For each of the phases of this converter, we have um, what we call an arm. We have two arms. We have the upper arm and the lower arm. And in each of those, you have a stack, which is a serious connection 
of a large number of a small power electronic converters that are called submodules, and each of them is about one megawatt of, of power rating. Those converters have a voltage rating of a few kilovolts, and then by stacking them in series, we reach the voltage ratings that are required for HVDC transmission. Before we go into more details about the technology itself and what we cover in the course, I want to tell you more about um, our teaching approach. So if you can move to the next slide. So these courses, as Balarco already said, they will include about five hours of uh, lectures with about 10 hours of guided exercises. So we will provide for each of those courses ready to use lecture recordings and a slides material for those lectures. We will provide exercises with model solutions that are linked to those lectures. And we will provide support material to enable self-assessment. We will also provide software simulation models that are used to generate the course material so that to enable anyone to modify the material and reuse it. Next slide. Now, we have, um, we, we, in our vision, we, we see different organizations using this material in different ways. So for example, one, for example, an individual could use the material that we provide as is. They, would, they could go through the recorded lectures, revise the material, go through the exercises themselves, and use the model solutions to assess if they've understood the concept. Next. But um, another way to do it, for example, for an organization would be to give the, uh, the people who would take the course access to the recordings or the, and the material, ask them to revise that, and then organize a live problem session where there would be an instructor that would be helping those that are taking the course, solving the questions, and would discuss the model solution. But we make all material available, so there is a still another possible use case for this material. If you want to move next, which is basically as we give access to the source of the slides and the material that is used to produce the exercises and everything in the course, someone could borrow that material to expand it, record their own lectures, make their own exercises, make lecture notes or whatever it is convenient to adapt the course to their specific needs. Next slide. Now, for the VSC HBC course, this is what we expect the, the students to be able to do by the end of the course. We want them to have an understanding of the differences between the voltage source converter technology and the classic line commutated converter HVDC technology that has been available for many, many decades. They should be able to uh, derive the steady state equations of the modular multilevel converter and understand where the operating region of the converter comes from. They should have an understanding of how to do basic tuning of the controllers of the modular multilevel converter. They should be able to assess the dynamics of the MMC um, for given controllers, for the given capabilities of the hardware. And they should be able to create basic models of MMCs for power system simulation studies. And they should have also an appreciation of the state of the technology of modular multilevel converters and VSC HVDC. Next slide. Now, the course is structured in this way. So as we said, we have about five to six hours of, of lectures. These are distributed across two different lectures. And then we have a set of guided exercises that are linked to the content of the lectures. So in the next few slides, I'm going to tell you a bit more about specifically what is it that we cover in those, in those lectures. Next slide. So with the first lecture, um, basically, the focus of, of, our, of our module is very much on the, the needs for those who are going to be working on uh, power system operators, the people who are going to be interested in understanding the capabilities of HVDC converters and the dynamics of these HVDC converters. Now, the first thing to do to tune the controllers for an MMC or to understand how they work um, is to start looking at how you control a very basic um, uh, inverter. So we start uh, in the first lecture using a simple inverter to basically set the scene to talk about the current controller, the energy controllers that are used both in a small scale inverter as well as in an MMC HVDC scale converter. And we discuss how those controllers are, are designed. Next slide. In the second part of this lecture, we give an overview of the VSC HVDC topologies for, for, uh, based on MMC. 
So we talked, we give an overview of what are the challenges of designing a converter for HVDC scale voltages. We give an overview and a qualitative comparison of the different topologies, of modular multi-level converters and VSCs that are used for high voltage application. And once when we've done that, we then do go through the basics of MMC where we do, um, uh, where we talk about specifically the circuit that is used in the MMC. We show how to derive the average model of, of an MMC. We show how to derive the steady state equations and we use them to discuss uh, the operating region of, of an MMC. And that would be it for the first session. Now the second session, next slide. The second session has a big part on dynamics. So we talk about the specifics of control of an MMC. We talk about how we generate the switching signals that drive the firing of the IGBTs in the submodules of a converter. We talk about how those are balanced. We talk about how we determine the current references for a, a PQ order of the converter for a given operating point. And we talk about the control loops that are going to be in an MMC. Then um, we use a series of simulation studies to, to discuss the dynamics of the MMC converter and, and how it behaves under different scenarios. And at the end of this session, next slide, please. We have a session about uh, final remarks where we look at um, example parameters of typical parameters of MMC. And, and this is just to give um, some, some basic parameters that anyone can use if you need, for example, to put together a basic simulation model of an MMC and you don't know what a specific case. So we give typical parameters that can be used to put together like a basic example of, of an MMC. And then we give an overview of the current research agenda that is related to MMC HPDC, the circuit topologies that are being developed to deal with DC faults and other applications that are relevant to VSC, HVDC, such as DCDC or tapping. Next slide. So this is just a screenshot of um, a slide from, from uh, the, the course. So basically we are following the same slide template of GPST and the slides will, will cover the, all the material of the lecture in, in quite a bit of detail. So the equations and brief explanations will be covered there so that the slides are uh, a good source material to, for revision of the lecture. We'll share with you um, a series of files. So um, Emily's posted these links in the chat and you'll be able to download the material. Um, so following this webinar, you'll have access to the slides of, of a, a lecture, which is on basics of, of MMCs, and also the example exercise that I'm going to talk about in a couple of slides. Next slide. Okay, so this is a short clip uh, where I'm going to embarrass myself showing you um, how, how I talk about, about VSC HBDC. So um, Emily, if you want to play, you're going to see a couple of minutes of that lecture. Welcome to this lecture on basics of MMC VSC HBDC. Today we'll be looking at the steady state equations of the MMC converter. These are the equations that will relate voltages and currents across the converter. We will use a simplified model of the converter, looking at a single phase of the converter. The derivation of the equations for the whole converter is just uh, replicating the, the same process for the rest of the phases. The voltage source converter um, has capacitors that store energy and they are used to generate voltages that are in turn used to control the currents that the converter exchanges with the network. Um, in the simplified model, we model each of the stacks of the converter, which are uh, chains of some modules, as an equivalent voltage source that we can control. And this is what you can see in the diagram that is shown in this slide. To derive the equations, we use Kirchhoff law on the, on the circuit that you see in the slide. And um, you obtain a set of equations that relate the DC voltages and uh, uh, AC voltages to the DC currents and the AC current respectively. Unlike other types of converters, MMCs have the ability to control the current they exchange with the AC network independently from the current they exchange with the DC network. And it's convenient to have these two relationships or these two exchanges of power explicitly in the equations. Now, if you look at the equations of the converter on the right side, 
you see that we have some relationships between voltages and currents, but um, in those equations, you will see terms that correspond to the upper arm of the converter, to the lower arm of the converter, and the grid. And they're all mixed. So changing any of the voltages affects all of the currents, or uh, to change um, any of the currents, you have to change all the voltages. Um, it is convenient um, to introduce a variable change that converts this circuit that you see here into equivalent circuits that decouple the exchange with the AC network with the exchange uh, with the DC network. The variable change is what you see in here. So we have a new set of variables that uh, we label as summative and differential. The summative uh, magnitudes are obtained by adding uh, the variables that correspond to the upper arm and the lower arm. With the differential, they're obtained by subtracting the uh, lower arm and the upper arm. So um, the relationship that you see here, they can be inverted and they can be used to transform between variables that correspond to upper and lower arm of the converter and variables that are in terms of summative and differential components. And if you introduce these new variables to the equations of the circuit, you can identify those equations um, into two equivalent circuits that you see below. One uh, controls the exchange of current with the AC network, the other one controls the exchange of current with the DC network. Okay, thank you. Next slide. Next. Okay, so um, I want to talk a little bit about the software that we've chosen to use, uh, both to create the material that is shown in the slides and also to create the exercises that the students would do. So we've chosen open tools that anyone can use. And um, we've chosen the following tools. So uh, next, please. For dynamic simulation, which is an important part for understanding how the converters work, we use open modelic and we use it to implement dynamic models of the converters and electrical power system. Next. And for general tasks of numerical analysis, plotting, um, we use Jupyter notebooks with Python. Next slide. So next slide, please. Yeah, okay. So I just want to say a couple of things about, about those software uh, tools. So um, Open Modelica is a set of, of open source tools to work with uh, the Modelica mod uh, language. So Modelica language is a, is a standard language for uh, building models of dynamical systems. Here you can describe um, physical models and their physical connections to other elements. And it's something that can be used to simulate electric circuits, mechanical systems, and so on. So it has a, a, a library, um, a standard library of, of components, electrical components of transformers, resistors, inductors, um, electrical machines. And we've used those to create the models of converters that we used to uh, create the simulation studies that are shown in the course. Um, next slide. And for the numerical calculations to produce plots and things that may be required to solve the exercises that are proposed for the course, we use Jupyter Notebook. So Jupyter Notebook, for those who don't know it, it's, it's um, an interface to write um, Python code, but combined with formatted text. So this way you create a live document that can be used um, to produce a calculation, but it can also be used to produce a document that, for example, can be exported as a document that can be printed or can be read as a PDF. So we've written the descriptions of our exercises as Jupyter uh, notebooks. And the idea is that by doing so, we can share that with the students, either in that format or in a PDF. And then the students can use that as a starting point to write their own solution. And once they complete the solution, if this is to be used with an instructor that is going to assess if the students have been able to complete the exercises, they would be able to share the solution either as their edited Jupyter notebook that the instructor may be able to open and run in their own computer or export it as a document that can be printed or can be reviewed from the computer as a PDF. So I have a next, uh, in the next slide, I have a short video that John Mark put together just, just to show the, the process of uh, working with a Jupyter notebook for those who never seen that before. So Emily, if you want to play that video. So in here we have a blank document in Jupyter Notebook. 
let's start. Here is where we input our text or code into, into this file. These cells could be a set code where we can develop small programs, or could also be some plain text where we can use to describe what we are doing or to provide explanations, or even we can add equations that describe the calculations we are performing. So we can choose if it's code or text by choosing here code or markdown. Then we can add more cells as we need, or we can, for example, delete them. So let's start with a simple example to see how this works. So we could define a variable, for example, x1, and we can give it some value. And we could just Play the value of this variable in the in the file. For example, we could run now this cell, and we get the value here. We could also now do some operations. For example, we could define another variable. We could also add some libraries, like as I said before, NumPy, to get access to. Uh, other mathematical functions that are not available uh, as it is now. Or we could also get uh, libraries that helps us to do plotting, like Matplotlib. So we have just seen some uh, basic commands on how we can do plots and work with uh, vectors. Let's now see, for example, how we could add some text to describe the different operations we have done. Thank you. Yeah. So as you can see, we speed up the video so that um, to keep it short and, and, and sweet. But um, I guess um, it is just to this is just to show you the kind of explanations that you may also expect to see with uh, with a course material. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, so the, the, about the guided exercise, I just want to insist a little bit more about um, what we think uh, one can do with those. So um, it's something that can be done by anyone on their own and just use the model solutions to, um, to check if, if the results make sense and, and so on. But um, an organization may, may organize a session with an instructor. And I think there is a lot of value in that because if a person with experience um, can go through the material, and can go through the um, and then see the solutions of the of the students, or they help and support the students while they are doing the exercises. At the end, they can put special emphasis on those topics that they've seen that the students have struggled to follow, or the places that they found more challenging. Next slide. So to give you an overview of what we covered with the guided exercises for the BSC HBDC. Um, course, we have two parts, one that is related to the steady set analysis and another one that is about dynamics. And this gives you a flavor of what we expect the students to be able to do by going through the course. So we, in the steady state analysis, we will be able to uh, calculate the details of the steady state operating points so for a PQ value for a given voltage of the network, calculate all the currents and voltages and visualize the key waveforms of the converter. And also as a most, more advanced exercise, determine from that what region of PQ the converter is able to, to uh, achieve. And on the, on the dynamic side is about understanding how to tune the controllers, how to simulate the converter and basically um, validate the derivation of the steady state that I talked about from the steady state analysis and also uh, simulate uh, the transient behavior of the converter. Next slide. So um, when we design those exercises, we try to have first some tasks that are kind of basic tasks to understand that the key concepts of the lecture are understood. And then we have more challenging tasks that take a bit more effort and a bit more ambitious, that, uh, but more interesting results. So in this example here, task one was about determining the currents inside the converter, the voltages the converter is applying for a set point of P and Q. And, and task two is about using this to then um, obtain the, the range of operation of the converter, knowing the limits of current voltage that the converter can, can achieve. 
If you want to go to the next slide, um, we have a short video from Joan Mark explaining the, the steps to complete one of those exercises. Obviously, again, this is something that is quite long. So here we just have a couple of minutes of that explanation. So Emily, do you want to play this video? Now solve one of the exercises of the course as example of how to do that in Jupyter Notebook. So here we have the guidelines of this exercise. And we have the circuit of the converter we are gonna consider now and some parameters are shown here in this table. We will start solving task one, which basically asks to calculate the magnitude and angle of the output voltages and currents for this converter. Uh, given a power set point, which is the one we see here. So we first are going to describe the different steps we need to, to carry out to solve the edge size. Once we have these two components, we can now then calculate the AC components of the upper and lower amp currents based on the sum of its and different uh, transformation. As you can see, here. And then here we have different expressions that we will need to solve this task. When we have described this, we can now include some code to solve and get the numerical results. Okay, so we have solved the first part of task one. And we can see here how we could write down the different steps we are going to do and then solve it and print it in the same document. And finally, I would like to present or describe briefly task two. And despite we don't have time to go into detail to describe the, the different steps we need to solve it as we did before with task one A and B. I would like to present it in here just to show how we can use this tool to solve more advanced exercises. And in here, we are asked to calculate the boundaries of operation of the converter we have seen in the introduction. And we are giving some maximum operating points for that converter. For example, we are giving the maximum current that um, the power devices can hold or we are giving the maximum voltage that the stack of some modules can withstand. And also it um, makes us to consider that the converter have a minimum voltage that could apply because we have a uh, half with some models, in this case will be zero. And also a maximum voltage that the converter can modulate. In this case, it depends on the available energy of the sub models. So based on, on these limits that we provide here, we should be able to calculate the different operating boundaries of the converter. So to do that, what we should do is to get the, the steps we developed in task one, where we are giving a set point of P e and Q and we're calculating the different currents and voltages. And we're also calculating the maximum of uh, those states over one period. And we could use uh, those expressions, we use them to calculate the maximum and minimum operating points for those states for a large range of peak Q points. This is uh, described here as a heat of the exercise. So if we do that, for example, for the current, for the upper amp current, we would end up having that for a, a large region of PQ set points, we would get a um, surface that looks like this one, the one it's colored fully here, that are the maximum current points for each of these PQ set points. Then we could plot as well the plane that corresponds to the maximum current that the converter can hold, which is uh, this 1.78 kiloamperes, and that will be this uh, red plane here. That, and then we can then plot the intersection of those states with the planes that define the, the maximum operating limits of the converter, as we saw in this figure. So we can do that with the contour plot. And if we do that, we will get a result that looks like this. So here we see the different operating boundaries of the converter and the intersection of all of them. The region inside all of them is the region that the converter could operate. 
So this is just an illustrative example of a more advanced edge site that will be solved in the course. Okay, so um, yeah, um, next slide. So basically that's that's all for our, our, our preview of the teaching material for the VSC HBC. And now I would like to invite you um, to ask us questions. We have some time to, to, uh, to review those. I haven't paid a lot of attention myself to the chat during the talk, but I would also invite Tim Balarco and John Mark to join us because uh, you may address some questions that are relevant to them. So. Indeed, and thank you very much, Adria. Um, that was a very slick and masterful combination of videos and slide materials and, and all sorts of things. I think it's given us a, a, a glimpse into what the, the fully developed course will be like um, and an indication of what one of the 90 individual topics across the teaching agenda uh, could look like. Look, so this is very much um, us sharing at, a, at an early stage the way the course materials are developing. So we'd like to hear comments from people who might um, might end up being users of this material, or people who might um, want to contribute in some way to the teaching agenda of the GPST and interested in following the footsteps of Adria and, and John Mark in preparing uh, one of the topics. So there are some remarks in the chat which are. Um, specific technical questions. So I'm going I'm to hold those back for a little while uh, while we talk a bit more about ways in which teaching material can be can be shared um, across the universities of the world. Um, so there is a question uh, from Tamar Ibrahim asking how you can register or access the full materials on the course, and I realise we haven't said anything about that. So. If you would, I'll just say a little bit about that. Um, the intention is that all of the materials that GPST develops are, are, are available in an open fashion. So we've been funded um, by USAID um, to provide four of further topics um, led by women presenters and educators. Uh, they will be shared via a Creative Commons style license. We haven't yet got our server up and our repository for that. Um, but that is the intention, uh, so that people can use the video materials directly or the slide material with their own presentation and indeed the exercises. So all of that will become open. All we're sharing today are the samples that Adria and John Mark have talked about. Their full topic will also be shared in due course. Um, is that fair and accurate, my fellow panelists? Please. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, before we turn to some of the quite technical questions, I wonder, Adria, there were a couple of things on my mind as you spoke. Now, I know that you teach HVDC at Imperial. I know that you've experimented with flipped classroom style. I'll be interested in innovative forms of teaching. I'd be interested to hear your comments. How much additional effort is there, once you have a set of teaching material that you've maybe taught for two or three years, to get it into this format of, of online exercises and, and videos, how much additional effort is there? Um, okay, so yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I think from our part, I think most of the effort has been on um, moving the simulation studies that are included in the in the course to the open Medallica environment just because what the original material that I had from the course that I'm teaching was based on 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 another software package and then we had to port some of that um, in terms of the course material um, it's been quite quite easy but I've had to scale down a module that is uh, has a broader scope and, and remove part of uh, a big part of that to make it specific on the HB on the key elements that are relevant on MMC technology for those that are um, uh, the stakeholders of of the GPST. Um, yeah, so I think the maybe I haven't mentioned you've mentioned that I think Balarco mentioned that I've had experience. Uh, so for five years, I've been teaching uh, part of a module that covers BSC, HBDC here. 
So for those five years, I've been polishing part of this material. I think things haven't changed a lot over the, say, the last two years. I've been making like incremental changes over the first few years, kind of basically tuning how much emphasis I give to different aspects. So um, as Balarco said, I mean, this it would be great if experts from different areas that, for, that can contribute to the different courses, because they may have experience teaching those topics and they may know exactly how to do it. And it may, can be very easy for them if they've thought about those topics uh, to produce the material for this. There's a, so there's a mixture of some questions coming in the Q&A window and some questions coming in the chat. If you can put them in the Q&A window, it's slightly easier for us to manage, but never mind. Uh, so from the chat, Tibin Joseph asks what the rationale for using Python for the exercises was rather than MATLAB or Simulink or PSCAD, which are perhaps more commonly found and in, in industry accepted. So why did we go that route, Adria? Um, thanks, Stephen, for your question. Well, that's something that we thought quite a bit about, but it's, it's really the key is to make this available to anyone and in particular to uh, universities or, um, or uh, utilities in developing countries, I think it's, it's very beneficial to be able to use open source tools. Um, again, I know that some of those packages are, 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 are common, some of the commercial packages. So we hope that with this material, it would be very easy for anyone to translate kind of to the inverse process. So if they're going to be working on PSCAT or are they going to be working on Dix Island, hopefully use our material as a starting step to implement that in their own software package. But that, that was the idea. Yeah. I mean, we would welcome some feedback from, from this audience, um, either now or, or email into us at some point about whether that does feel like a good choice. So, so if you're in a well-established university in a developed country, you probably have a MATLAB license that's university-wide and simulate. And, and that's indeed what we would often use. But we wanted to make sure this was available to people whose universities perhaps wouldn't afford or wouldn't ordinarily have a, a you know a site-wide MATLAB license. That's not a not a cheap undertaking. So, so. Okay, so feedback on that would be useful. Um, where am I going next? Sorry. Adadayin in a Sorry if I have scrambled your name. I did my best. I promise you. Um, is asking in the Q and A. Um, how people can contribute to the development of, of, the, of the teaching materials. Um, we would love people to help us with this. It's not, this is not an Imperial College exercise by any means. We, we, we just sort of try to put a toe in the water and do the first one. If you're interested in, then please have a look at the teaching agenda and the 90 or so individual topics under nine headings that are in there. And if there's something that you you like to contribute in there, please get in touch with us. Um, we have been trying to fundraise to support this activity. Um, you know, it takes considerable effort, as, as you can see, to uh, make the material available in this fashion. So we want to compensate people for their time. You, you not get rich doing this, but we want to compensate people for their time. So there's a bit of a limit to how much of that we can do at the moment until we've raised more funds. But if you're interested in being part of this endeavor, then please, please join us. Um, uh, oh, okay. Thank you, Harvey, for your comments about the usefulness of open source with, with respect to people in the industry who might, again, still not have access to, to um, MATLAB and similar quite expensive tools. Um, who, Romana Buddha asks us all what, who the target participants and students for the course are. Um, who might want to pick up that? Belarco, could you say a little bit about it? Who, who's our target audience? Sure. Um, um, I mean, generally speaking, of course, I mean, it varies a bit from one topic to other, but generally speaking, this is meant for uh, postgraduate students who are specializing in power. Uh, that's within the university. And then uh, as far as industry audience is concerned, it's system operators, maybe in this case, some of the vendors as well. Uh, so it's, I mean, to an extent, these uh, target audience vary from one topic to another. And once we share some of these topic descriptors with you, uh, you will be able to find a section under each topic descriptor who the target audience is. 
I hope yeah. that answers your question. Yes. Um, Stephen Browning has been asking several questions and people have been coming in on the back of that on um, DC grids and DC protection and Adria has, has given part of the answer in the chat to that. So I won't go over that exactly, but um, if you look at the teaching agenda under the HVDC heading, we have five topics. So, so one is about challenges to do with, with line accommodated systems. One is this concentration on voltage source converters, and you've seen that one now. Then the others are specific to offshore networks, DC grid protection, and the interaction between HVDC and AC. Uh, and that might not be the end of the story. Those are the five topics that uh, the teaching agenda group decided to prioritize uh, about a year ago. Um, link to the teaching agenda has just been dropped into the chat by, uh, by Emily as well. Um, grid, so Stephen in the Q&A is asking about grid forming um, technology. Uh, sorry, just a sort of confusing message. Um, I don't know who wants to either Balak or Adria pick up on perhaps the presence of grid forming within the teaching agenda and, and how it relates to HVDC. I can take this one, uh, Tim. So we have uh, a, a topic, a separate topic devoted to grid forming in the general sense, irrespective of the sort of the technology that sits behind it. And that is coming under the subject area of stability and protection. So, I mean, we have it separate, but you are right, of course, I mean, grid forming can be wrapped up around an HVDC as well. But I mean, the details of the specifics of grid forming would be covered in that particular topic, which is under the stability and protection in the teaching agenda. So Parfait Lutendula is asking whether multi-terminal um, HVDC is going to be covered. Bilako, I believe it is. Would you like to comment? Yes. Um, again, it's a, it's a separate topic under the HVDC subject area. Uh, we are going to specifically focus on the protection aspect of uh, multi-terminal as well as DC grid. Well, some people use those two interchangeably but uh, the protection issues mainly around multi-terminal and DC grid would be covered in a separate topic. So as we've uh, mentioned, we've, we've got four other topics that are under development that they're a little bit behind this one in terms of where they are on the, on the development timeline, um, but they're scattered. So we're not, um, we're not, going all of the HVDC and then move on. So we have topics to do with electric vehicle integration. We have topics to do with um, grid stability. We have a topic to do with markets. And I've missed one, Balaka. Which one have I missed of the four? Uh, uh, low system inertia, issues around that and mitigation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to find topics across the whole domain as, as exemplars and feel our way forward. Um, Okay, uh, so, so we would encourage you to, to take a look at the materials. We'd love you to, to spend a bit of time with them and come back and tell us whether you think, as, a, as an educator, that you, you would find this particular material useful and, and if it was rolled out across the whole teaching agenda, whether your university would, would, would pick it up and use it. Uh, and also, if, if you are a practicing engineer in industry, and are looking to um, come up to speed with a topic that perhaps wasn't in your university education, however many years ago that was, then again, comments on its, its approachability and usefulness would be extremely valuable. We want it to serve both a kind of continuing professional development audience and a, um, a university education audience. Um, and comments also about whether other universities have been experimenting with the flipped classroom ideas that. Adria talked about whether this material is useful in that format or whether you'd use it more traditionally as um, either running the lecture videos or, or taking the slide decks and, and you yourselves presenting to the slide decks and then using the exercises. Um, so I'm having to read and talk at the same time. 
Tibin, I can see you've made another comment and I'm just trying to see, oh yes, there is a question at the end of it. Um, uh, so it's a slide his, his earlier comment. So using the Delica and Python for research is a great thought and it's appreciated. However, um, will that be a disadvantage for graduates to enter industry environment where commercials are used? And do you have any views? Um, that is an interesting question, isn't it? Whether, whether it's the job of the universities to um, use commercial tools in order that people come up to speed on those tools and are immediately useful to, you, to, to industry, or whether we use tools that are a bit more approachable. Um, let, let me just give you a little bit of my experience and then I'll turn to my colleagues. I have had students, research students in particular, try to use the Power Factory and Dig Silent um, suite of tools. And it is an extraordinarily um, lengthy learning process before you become proficient in that. Uh, so as a research student, perhaps you can do that. As a, as a student on a talk course where you've got to turn around a piece of coursework in, in a week, there isn't time to become proficient in those tools. And, and my experience, it's students become proficient in MATLAB and Simulink quite readily and can turn that to lots of different physical systems. Whereas the specialist tools, you you need professional training on them. But I don't know where Jean-Marc, Adria, would you like to come in on your thoughts on should we be using commercial tools in our teaching or should we use generic tools? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's a difficult question, yeah. Yeah, the, the pros and cons, I think there are clear. Um, we went for the openness just because we wanted to release everything. And, um, but yeah, I think I, I agree with your point, Tim, that, that those commercial packages, um, people to use them professionally, it's good to have some specific training. And, and sometimes it can come from the, uh, from the company that makes the software themselves. And, that's what we've seen in the past and it worked quite well um yeah i think for the type of of simulations we are considering here in the course i think it's kind of easy to move from one to the other it's it's uh, the interface for example for the model is quite um, quite easy to use uh, kind of simulink interface so i think it's it's yeah. uh, it's a good thing to have uh, the open source since it's easy to build the same model in, in simulink if if you have to once you understood the base of, of how it works. Can I come in on that, uh, Tim, just to add a uh, few points. Uh, first of all, it's a very good question, Tim. And I mean, within JPST, we have discussed this at length because apparently, as you rightly said, there's a conflict. But let me tell you, this is not just about workforce development where we are trying to use the open source tools. G GPST as a whole is generally pushing for use of open source tools because we see this as an opportunity as the transformation is happening to sort of get, sort of push the use of open source tools. So there is a separate pillar, one out of the five pillars that I showed at the very beginning, which is dedicated to open source tools and models. So we are really pushing for use of open source tools even within industry. And uh, if the graduates are exposed to these tools, they can sort of communicate capabilities of these tools and. That's how we hope that the change is going to happen. So just to give you a broader perspective on this. Yeah. Okay. Um, we're pretty much where we are at the top of the hour, which, for whichever hour in the time zone you're, you're in. Uh, so I would like to wrap this up. I'm conscious there are a couple of things that are still in the chat and the QA. Um, uh, there's some specific questions about why you know, the circumstances in which you'd use DC over AC. I think we'll try and, Joseph, um, answer that um, in the, in the follow-up email that Emily will be say, sending. So Emily will, in a few days, send a link to the recording of the session. It will repeat the links to the material to download the samples of the lecture slides and videos and, and, and teaching materials. And if there are unanswered questions, we will get to those and, and post them linked to that email. Um, one of the questions I just saw, I can't even remember where now, was asking is when this first training module on, on uh, VSC HVDC will be available. 
in its entirety rather than in sample form. Uh, we are very close to that. The, probably the bigger holdup is us finalizing what server to place it on and, and, and how to stream the video. Um, but, keep, but keep an eye on that. And by the autumn, we will have the next four topics that we've mentioned available. So by the autumn, we should have five. Clearly, there's a long way to go before we have the full 90, but we'll keep chipping away at it. So um, uh, thanks to Emily and the wider NREL team for facilitating the event today. Um, thank you for, for uh, Balaka for introducing the session and, and doing tremendous work on leading the Pillar 3 on behalf of the whole of the GPST. Thank you enormously to Adria and Jean-Marc for all they've done in, in trailblazing the, the, the teaching and, and then presenting it today. I hope you found that taster useful. It could only be a taster of what is a five hour set of lectures and, and then a 10 to 15 hour set of exercises. So we hope we've, we've whet your appetite and you, you come and look at the whole thing in due course. Thank you all for your questions and your participation in general and showing some interest. Um, please um, get in touch. Um, I think Emily will give you some coordinates in her follow-up email. That, so get in touch if you want to express opinions on open source versus specific commercial software. Get in touch if you'd like to participate in developing further topics. And we'll be delighted to welcome you on board. And get in touch if you're a potential user of this material and, and would like to offer some feedback. So with all of that said, with all of those many, many thank yous, which are all heartfelt, I assure you, uh, we'll bring this session to a close. Thank you.